And we're going to focus now on some key courses within the university and get some uh, key people within those courses to talk to us about those courses. So um, we're, going to, we're going to split it into a few shorter sessions of 15 minutes um, and we're going to make sure that um, the speakers have some opportunity to answer questions at the end as well. So um, we're going to talk through four key programs um, and the presenters on those will talk through it. So the first one we're going to look at is the introduction to new, our new medical imaging program. And I have Dr. Gregory Van Egmond here, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about that. So please make him feel welcome. Well, good morning. How are we all? All caffeinated? Good to go again? Excellent. Now, my name is Dr. Greg Van Egmond, and I'm a lecturer in the brand new medical imaging degree. Now, you might think I'm too young to be a lecturer, but that's part of Deakin Innovation. Um, I did do my PhD through Deakin, and I can highly recommend it. Um, the medical imaging degree, as you can see here with my boss um, pictured on the screen, he's not the uh, plastic model there that's nice and blue though, um, that's one of our X-ray models. So I'll talk to you about our new imaging degree. So most of you might be asking, what is medical imaging? Well, medical imaging is also known as medical diagnostic radiography or medical radiation technology. But you might simply know people who have graduated from a degree similar to this as a radiographer. Now, radiographers are responsible for production of high quality images using techniques such as X-ray, CT, MRI and ultrasound. And most people get confused between a radiographer and a radiologist. The ologists are the ones that have trained as a medical doctor and then go on to um, specialise in interpreting the medical images produced by a radiographer. So we're in the field of producing radiographers. Now, here are some examples of some of the images that might be produced. You can see the person who seems to be sliced between front and back, and that's an MRI image. There's also one of the brain, and you can see the one that's really cool of the blood vessels. That is CT angiography. So these are techniques that we would expect our graduates to eventually move into. And of course, things like ultrasound, where there's the cute baby down the bottom. So the role of a radiographer is essentially to produce high quality images for use in medical diagnosis of disease or injury. They aren't there to provide a diagnosis, they're there to give the best quality images to someone who will make a diagnosis. So they form an integral part of the clinical team and basically an essential part. So their specialty is producing the images. So those images and the quality of them determine some clinical decisions. So most of you would have come into contact with a radiographer at some stage, whether you've had an X-ray or an ultrasound or MRI. So these are the people we're producing. So because you're advising students, students will want to know what's the end prospect for a radiographer. Well. Currently, there is shortage um, of numbers of radiographers in rural and regional Australia, and the government has actually predicted that there will be a shortage across Australia, which will get more and more as time progresses. Okay? There are a lot of old radiographers out there, so we need to replace them with new ones. Okay? We're not pushing them off the edge, we're simply meeting the demand as it is um, met. Now the graduates, if they come out with an undergrad only, um, could earn somewhere around 58000 a year. If they then further specialise in some of the advanced modalities, they can earn upwards of 108000 a year. So it's not too bad. I'd be happy with that. Um, so we will be offering some of the advanced training beyond the undergraduate degree as well. And that'll be done in conjunction with the University Hospital Geelong. 
as well as the brand new Epworth Hospital that's being built next door to our Warren Ponds campus, where, where we're actually training the radiographers. So our students will have opportunities to then move into teaching once they've graduated. They can work in research facilities as well. And if they so desire, they can take on the business management side of things and start up their own company. So why might they want to choose Deakin? Well, I think this was highlighted very nicely by the Vice-Chancellor, um, but to reiterate, it is a multi-award winning university with an international focus. So we are very inclusive of different cultures and we expect our students to be able to adapt to whatever culture they're in. We're also a young university, which means our facilities are beautiful. Example, okay? This facility is lovely. Now, our facility for training our medical radiographers is also lovely. It is a very new building down on the Warren Ponds campus and it costs a lot of money. You can see $53 million up there. Part of that went into producing our spaces as well. And we have three state-of-the-art x-ray rooms which our students can walk into and it's essentially like walking into a radiography ward on a hospital. So they have multiple opportunities to get that on hand, hands-on training. So it is a beautiful facility. As well as that, it's set up beautifully for student private study. So we're trying to give them the best that we can. The degree goes for four years of full-time study and it runs on a semester-based system, but they are quite long semesters because there's a lot of content to go through. However, as part of our semester system, we've actually scheduled in clinical placements alongside their academic portions. So it means that our students don't have to use up their holidays to go on a placement. As well as that, we organise the placements for them. So that's a benefit for them um, and it can reduce the stress levels. There are substantial hours of workplace placement and that's to get them used to different environments and basically getting them used to how they will be working at the end of their um, time with us. And we've designed the course directly with um, the Medical Radiation Practice Board of Australia as well as AFRA, which is another regulation body in order to have our graduates, when they um, graduate from our degree, go on to be able to get registered and then they get recognised as a professional in their field. So, alongside that, we've paired our um, wonderful facilities with some innovative teaching techniques. And part of that involves using things known as problem-based learning tutorials. So we're actively using some of the higher cognitive areas of learning so that our students are able to retain knowledge better and actually apply that in a practical sense as well. So they will use things like problem solving, analysing and creating throughout the process. And it works also to provide a structure of teamwork which our industry partners have actually highlighted to us as a very important thing for them to see in student graduates. So they want people who can work as a team, not just people that know their stuff. So that's part of our degree from the core. Now, with the clinical placements, of course you would expect that it increases across the time. So in first year, they get six weeks of clinical placement time. In fourth year, they would get 24 weeks, which is essentially the same as them performing an internship year. But because it's part of our degree, again, they don't have to compete with other students for internship places. So that's a highlight, I think, of our course. As well as that, we give them a variety of experience. 
So there is rural, regional and metropolitan areas that our students will be getting those placements and they'll be able to record those on an e-portfolio to then demonstrate to a potential employer, I have already demonstrated these skills in this multiple set of areas. So it's a way that they can actually show what they can do. And here you can actually see one of our, what we call phantoms. This is Mr. Walker. He is uh, an X-ray um, dummy, which is good because it means we don't have to practice on our students. <laughs> now, something that you will probably need to keep an eye on will be the entrance requ requirements for the year intake coming, so the 2016 entrance requirements. We haven't finalised these as yet because we're trying to see how our intake from this year does. But this was what we based it around for this year's intake. We wanted a study score of at least 30 in English or 25 in one of the higher versions of English. And that's because we want our students to be able to communicate. You'd expect they'll have to write reports, so they need to be able to write and write fluently. They need study score of 25 in biology, physics or chemistry, and that's so that they've got a science background as well. And 25 in maths methods or specialist maths. This is because they come up against some equations and we want them to be able to calculate things from equations without too much hassle. So it's a pretty fair assessment really. Um, of course the applications go through VTAC and if you have students that are disadvantaged in any way, I would encourage you to fill out a C's form as the students may get bonus points which might make them eligible to get an offer. So it did make a difference this year, so I would recommend if you have students with that disadvantage to fill in those forms. Okay, and that basically is an overview of our medical imaging degree. If there are any questions um, that I might be able to help with, I'm happy to answer those now. Otherwise, you can contact us via these, or I've got my business cards on the table here if you would like for later. More than happy for you to contact me. I just wanted to ask, uh, does the student choose one of those specialities in the undergraduate degree and do they come out with that specialisation? Okay, so can they specialise in the undergraduate degree? No, they can't. The specialisation comes in a postgraduate form and that's because they need to have that base before they can specialise out. And that's to ensure that their specialty is actually um, best developed through the process. So it's four years and then how long is the postgrad specialisation? Um, they're usually one to two years um, to specialise. It can be a longer period depending on how far they want to specialise. Um, in which case they could do an honours year and then a PhD version on top. But to actually practice, they'd have to do at least one year post-grad. Yes, yes, to specialise more fully. And that's because those um, machines take a lot, more, um, a lot more technical knowledge in order to get the best quality images. So just to clarify, at the end of the four-year undergraduate, they can't work as an X-ray or as a... Object. No, they can do X-rays. Um, they can do some specialisation in X-rays. Um, but they cannot do things like full MRI or um, digital subtraction, angiography or ultrasound. Okay. And that's because um, they will need extra training to go on those. So they, they get their X-ray at the end of the first four years? Yes, so X-ray capabilities are... And you will find most radiographers that you come into contact with in hospital-based system um, in the x-ray departments, they have simply done an undergraduate degree. So there are plenty of places for those students and there's progression above that and in work training as well. No worries. All right, thank you very much. Round of applause. Thanks, mate. All right, up next we have uh, Professor Matthew Allen who is the Head of Communications and Creative Arts to talk to us. 
information up. That one? Yep. There we go. All right. Brilliant. There we go. Thanks so much for your time. I hope you're learning about all the wonders that Deacon has to present. It's not surprising being in charge of the School of Communication and Creative Arts, but I want to ask you to help your students, our students hopefully, to see the world a little differently. A lot of talk about what will people do when they leave university. Well, in our school, we will set them up for a rich and valuable career in some of the fastest growing industries around the creative and cultural industries. It's all about telling stories, stories that change the world. And the kind of students that we would like to see come into our courses are those who have that passion to reach inside themselves to be a storyteller across many different forms, to find and explore their creative potential, to see where it will take them, to aspire to be someone like Nadia Taff, one of Australia's greatest filmmakers who's now an adjunct professor with us and to become leaders in the business and the culture of communication and creative arts. To help them to do that, we offer the usual array of things that every university will tell you. The state-of-the-art facilities, the industry professional, the engagement with the community, all of the things that mean that students aren't just studying the media, studying filmmaking, they're making and doing. They are from the first seminar, the first workshop, the first practical engaging with the real world that they will go into and become leaders in three years' time. We don't have one course, we have an array of courses, three in communication that I'll talk about in a moment. These are all new this year, building on a very long and proud history at Deakin in the subject areas, but with the courses fine-tuned to maximise employment and engagement. I'm, I'm told I'm fading at the back. Sorry, it's, a, it's, it's an old lecturer's habit. You want to wander around. We also have seven great creative arts degrees, and I'll talk a little bit more about those as well. We've had them for a very long time. Sometimes people don't even know that we do them, but we are producing some of the best young artists, filmmakers, dramatists in the state. We have a new degree in entertainment production as well, new this year, specifically designed to feed graduates into the entertainment industries. So let me talk a little about the Bachelor of Communication. There are three core areas, media, journalism and public relations. Might be hard to know what medical imaging is, I now know what it is, thank you, that was great. Pretty easy to know what media, PR and journalism are. But these are courses that are not about the path they're not about the hoary old journo swilling the red wine at lunchtime. Apologies to all my friends who are journos. <laughs> They're about the new world, the digital, the multi-platform, about the storytelling. Our journalism graduates do go out and work for The Age, for the advertiser in Geelong, for the ABC, but they also freelance, they work on websites. Our PR practitioners are not just spin doctors. They work with activist organisations, non-government organisations in corporate communications. And our new media degree is tuned to the ever-expanding world of the multiple digital screens that we all know and love, except when our students are using them in our classrooms. Yeah, we love that too, actually. Creative arts, a broad array. And I talk about creative arts as well because people think it's just making art and what's the career in that? But in each of those seven areas, animation, dance, drama, design, film and television, photography and visual arts, we also are emphasising the professional outcomes, the careers that people can build. One of our third year drama graduates has bought a theatre and is making a go of it. Our visual artists work in galleries as curators and producers of public art. A graduate of our film course now is the producer of the Martin Grook footy show, broadcast live from the studios that we have. It's about being savvy, and that's what we teach our students to be, not just the art, 
but how to make a career out of it and have fun while you're doing it. And in our new degree, the Bachelor of Entertainment Production, again, that is one of our focus. What can you do with your creative energy, not perhaps as the maker, but the producer and the facilitator, the cultural entrepreneur who can put together festivals, work for the ICC in staging the World Cup, work in local galleries all the way up to the NGV. That's what the Bachelor of Entertainment Production is doing, and we have our first cohort of 20 students starting this year. We're only going to take 20 students each year and give them the best experience they can have. It's all about a bright future for our students, your students. There are many specific jobs. Graduates in journalism, media, and PR go out into many different professions, about 50,000 a year starting salary, maybe a little bit less, a little bit more. We give them internships that get their foot in the door, guaranteed and indeed required in PR, pretty much guaranteed in journalism, developing in the media industries. It's also about a good career. We don't want people turning around in five years and realizing their job doesn't exist. We're teaching them how to reinvent themselves and, in fact, make a future for themselves where they, through their talent and the leadership that we teach them, will guarantee their future success. And have fun while they're doing it. Let's not forget how important that is. So, I want to wrap up so I can have a few questions from you to kind of draw out where you think this is going. What kind of Year 12 students are we looking for? What kinds of people should go into these courses? It's people who like to work with other people. Every one of our degrees is about teamwork, even when you're working individually, about helping people, about listening to them and finding out what their stories are to feed into your own work. We're looking for people with a bit of entrepreneurial savvy who are interested in the new business it's not just about going and doing a commerce degree and learning marketing and management. You learn those skills. When our third year students, in fact our second year drama students, go to the art centre in Melbourne and, and stage a found work in the forecourt, they've got to do all of the site analysis for occupational health and safety, manage relations with the, with the client who they're dealing with. When our visual design students do internships with arts organisations to do their design work, they're pretty much doing the job that they're going to go into. So it's about being able to listen, take and think, and then produce the stories that inspire and change lives. They're the kinds of students that we want so that they can come to us and help us through what we can teach them to make the world a different place. I was just going to ask, are there, is there any chance of postgraduate study in the entertainment production area? At the moment, we don't have a postgraduate degree in entertainment production. What we would recommend is that students take either our Master of Communication and specialise in TV production, design, PR or journalism and pitch their individual work, which can include applied industry research, into those kinds of entertainment industries. We also have a Master of Creative Arts, which is designed more for practic practitioners who want to make work but these are new degrees and quite flexible, and we will find a way to accommodate those individual differences. In time, I suspect we will move into that entertainment production field at the postgraduate level. Um, I just wanted to know whether it's possible to do um, one of the other majors, one of the other disciplines within the entertainment production, so to take a, a second major from that. The way that, the way that we've structured the entertainment production course, so in fact, I'll just step back a little bit about double majors. We have a great Bachelor of Arts. You have a student who loves history but says, oh, I don't think I can get a job in that. Oh, I probably should do journalism. That's cool. You do the BA and you double major in journalism and history. Our specialist degrees really up the level of learning in those areas to make sure that they are the very best candidates for the work that's available and that they can do the job brilliantly when they get there. So in the entertainment production degree, students do a third of their degree in entertainment production, including a long internship. We then require them to take another major. You can't actually be an entertainment producer unless you've got 
some knowledge of a creative art or a communication discipline. You can even go off to the business school and do marketing or management. It's a very flexible degree, really designed for the person who just gets that the world is in their hands and they can make it happen. And we're very excited to bring it to Melbourne. It's a version of what is taught very successfully at QUT in Queensland. We're the first university to have it here in Victoria. You can't do law in entertainment production. What we would recommend is that students do some of the law units. But again, for students who are interested in that double degree, they would choose the arts degree, doubles with law or commerce or science. And everything that I've talked about, all of those subject areas, film, PR, media, they're all available as majors inside the arts degree. It's sometimes a little complicated to explain to students because we try to give people so much choice. But we're always very w w welcome and willing to assist students in making that transition. And for example, a student who would start a BA majoring in journalism can then move into the specialist degree if they find their passion for it. We remain very flexible in giving students that six to 12 months to find their metier and then we will help them hone it to a razor sharp point. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Professor, thank you. <laughs> Fantastic insight there. All right, we'll keep moving. Um, we have now senior lecturer Kelly Miller, who's uh, representing environmental science. Thank you. Thank you, I always love coming to these events to hear about all these exciting new programs on offer in my own university. So thanks for those presentations. Uh, my name's Kelly, I'm a course director for one of our environmental science courses here at our Burwood campus. We have two environmental science courses running at Burwood. We have a couple of environmental science courses also running at Geelong and Warrnambool. But today I'll focus on the two that we run at Burwood and they are environmental management and sustainability and wildlife and conservation biology. Both three year courses uh, and Last year we celebrated 30 years of environmental science courses here at Deakin. So they're very long running courses uh, and well established. So today I'll give you a snapshot of the two courses as well as some ideas for career pathways in this field and some graduate outcomes. So the difference between the two, as I said, there's two courses running here at Burwood, Environmental Management and Sustainability and Wildlife and Conservation Biology. And the difference between the two is that students that would like to do wildlife and conservation biology are students that would like to be outside working with plants and animals, getting their hands dirty, doing lots of field work, um, perhaps working in parks, reserves, working um, in areas involving river management, oceans, coasts, all of those sorts of areas. Environmental management and sustainability covers all of that as well, but it's a little bit broader. So people that are interested in working with people to come up with solutions for some of the pressing environmental problems that we're facing. Um, and they might be interested in waste management, they might be interested in environmental impact assessment, they might be work interested in working with communities to develop environmental sustainability solutions and, and so on. So there's some overlap between the two courses, um, but they differ in the emphasis that we place on the different parts of environmental sustainability and environmental science within those courses. So one of the things that attracts students to these courses is that we have lots of opportunity for hands-on learning, as um, <coughs> was emphasised in some of those earlier presentations. Students are always out doing things. So we often say that our classrooms have no walls and we get students out of the university into the field to, to work on the issues that they're interested in. So we have lots of lab work, lots of field work, lots of um, camps, and also uh, short term, uh, shorter field, field trips um, during their units. We have lots of links with industry. So we have people from industry coming into Deakin for lectures, classes, tutorials. And we also then connect our students with people from industry when we take them outside of Deakin. We also have, as with all of our courses at Deakin, we have an advisory board. And that advisory board uh, consists of people from industry. So we're constantly talking with people working in the industry to inform the ongoing development of the courses. 
Our students get a lot out of the volunteer work that they do. And in this field, there are lots and lots of opportunities for volunteer work, whether it be working with a community group, um, a friends group, um, doing some volunteer work, planting trees, getting out there and doing some volunteer work out, outside of Beacon. And that's a really good uh, place to start for setting up a career in environmental science, making the connections and building the skills required for a career in this area. We also have some options for overseas study. So we have some specific units within the courses that allow students to study overseas. So we have one unit at third year level uh, where students actually go overseas to Borneo and study overseas and immerse themselves in a different culture. Um, a small group of students are able to take that unit. And then we have another unit called Global Environmental Placement where students are able to do some work experience overseas. And that counts towards one of their units. In addition to that, we also have professional work experience and that's part of another unit called professional practice where students are placed within an organisation that they might be interested in working with down the track uh, and building their skills within that organisation. So the courses are very flexible. There are core units obviously within each, each of the two courses and then we have uh, elective options. So students can take units from other courses. So I think there are a couple of questions around double degrees and majors. If students want to uh, build their expertise in business or law or management, um, property and real estate, all of those other sorts of uh, areas that tie in with environmental sustainability or environmental science, then they're able to do that and mix and match their units to do so. So along the way, they, the students work very closely with our team of academics. So these uh, places you see on the screen are people working in the teaching team and also in our research team and students have the opportunity to work with them closely in research projects and also as they go through their course. Now, as you will all know, one of the things, one of the most important things that students ask when considering courses is, will I get a job in this area? And we expect that in the green job area, there will be growth over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And obviously this goes in cycles, so sometimes there'll be ups and downs depending on the, the climate. But we expect that there will be uh, jobs growth in this area and we also uh, expect that our, the most of our graduates will, will gain employment in their chosen field. A few years ago we did some work to find out where our graduates have ended up and we surveyed about 130 of our graduates and the vast majority of those graduates were employed, I think it was 96% were employed, 91% were, um, sorry, 91% were employed, the, the remaining 5% out of that 96% were studying further, and then about 70% of those people working were working in their chosen field, so in environmental science. So this is really encouraging, knowing that our students are set up to work in this field and they're getting jobs, they're getting good jobs uh, and they're working in their chosen area. So some of the careers that we see for our graduates are listed here. So environmental managers, wildlife ecologists, scientists, educators, um, waste managers, sustainability officers and so on. And some of the logos there indicate the organisations that our graduates work with. So these are just a few of them. And what we're seeing now with this growth in this field is that students or graduates are now working in places that you might not have traditionally expected them to work because businesses, um, companies, um, not necessarily with a focus on environmental issues, they are looking at ways to green their business. They're looking at ways to uh, embed the principles of environmental sustainability into their companies, into their businesses. And so sometimes our graduates will work with those uh, less traditional um, companies as well. So lots and lots of opportunities and that's one of the things that we like most about our courses is that students have so many different directions to go in uh, and that makes it really exciting for them uh, on leaving Deakin. Just a couple of examples of some of our uh, graduates and students and where, where they're at and what they're up to. Um, a few faces on the screen there. So on the left we have Catherine Dennis, she's a current uh, third year student in environmental management and sustainability. She's she works very closely with uh, the city of Monash and uh, works on their environmental advisory board. Um, she's currently finishing off her degree. Next, second from the left, we have Traves, sorry, uh, Jackson Clark. 
and he's currently completing his honours degree working on stormwater management for the city of Whittlesey. He uh, finished his third the three-year degree last year and is moving into honours this year. Then the two gentlemen in the middle of the screen, um, second from the right up the top, Travis Moore, who is now working uh, at RMIT University. He went through his degree here, continued on to do honours uh, in energy efficiency in, in Victorian households, and then moved into RMIT University looking at renewable energies, renewable um, energy technologies, and uh, is working there as a research fellow after completing a PhD there. Similarly, Justin Lawson, second from the right on the bottom, uh, he completed his PhD here at Deakin and is now working in the Faculty of Health, um, where he is now bringing together environmental sustainability with environmental health and some of the um, concerns around human health and the need to have a healthy environment for healthy people. So, um, very multidisciplinary approach there. And then Elizabeth Lemus on the right-hand side, uh, a graduate from a few years ago, secured a position uh, straight out of her degree with the then Department of Sustainability and Environment, which has now just recently changed name. So lots of different uh, stories for our graduates, lots of exciting opportunities uh, for them uh, working out in the field after their degrees here at Deakin. One way that you can all um, tell your students about environmental science at Deakin is through our Enviro blog. So we have an Enviro blog where staff and students post stories, pictures, uh, exciting news items about their time in environmental science on this Enviro blog. And so if you're interested, if your students are interested in environmental science, they can log onto that Enviro blog uh, and read about what, what we're up to and perhaps give them a taste of what they might study if they were to come and study here at Deakin. The other thing I wanted to just flag with everyone, if you're interested and if your students might be interested, is the last, for the last couple of years we've been running an Enviro seminar uh, here at our Burwood campus. And this is to uh, connect our students uh, with some really high profile speakers and um, for them to hear about the experiences of people who are really passionate in this field uh, and contribute a lot to this field. So last year we had Dr Bob Brown visit us here at, at Burwood and our and we recorded that presentation, it's available on our website. And this year we're going to have Peter Garrett come to visit us in April. Uh, we're still finalising all the, the details, but if you would like further information about that, then please contact me um, and I can give you the information <coughs> once that comes through. And then you're welcome to pass that on to students, staff at your schools and they can uh, sign up for that and come along. I'll just finish uh, just with a short clip um, which features some of our students and our staff uh, to give you a bit of a, a taste of some of the things that we do. I feel that if we can start to integrate that environmental education in people, then we're going to see a shift in society because we're going to see a shift in society's values and valuing the environment and valuing having a sustainable lifestyle. I was very attracted to this particular degree course in wildlife and conservation biology. Very few degrees were tackling those major issues, so I was very keen to get a position. I was lucky enough to get that position. There's a great deal of positivity and good things happening out there, and our students are very much part of those solutions and can be part of those solutions. What I really love about the job is the, is the environment doing, you know, it's good work. It's good works in the sense of Ernst Kumark who used to say it. Students coming to the course can expect a really vibrant teaching environment. We love to get students out on the field and do things hands-on. For example, from seeing specimens to learn about the different morphologies of different skulls. Sometimes we say that our classrooms have no walls. We like them to actually experience real-world scenarios. So we think that that will give them a really fantastic skill set, high employability, and a really good idea of where they want to go with environmental science and with their degree. Deakin's really good at giving you major opportunities to go out into the workforce and work alongside people who are already there, who already know what they're doing, so that by the time you graduate, you already have a huge amount of experience, industry experience, that you can put on your resume, that you can understand how these things work in practice as well as in theory. 
we have a number of units where we're actually encouraging students to go overseas and there's a number of ways that students can study overseas, get credit for their learning overseas and bring that back. You're actually learning to have a career. You're learning to be a professional as you go through. My message to students is always that you can make a difference. If, you, if you're passionate, you apply what you've learned, you, you, you know, you could change the world. All right, well done. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, and just on a side note, all these presentations will be made available to you all and you'll be emailed a link um, at the conclusion of this event. So if there's some stuff that you've missed or some key nuggets you want to take away, um, you can definitely do that. Okay, just the last one before we, we move on to the next one is an academic and student's perspective of Deakin's Bachelor of Law. And I have two people here being Associate Lecturer Professor Patricia Perlin and Final Year Bachelor of Law student Mark Kale. Welcome. Thank Thanks, you. Dan. Cheers. Good afternoon and thanks for the upgrade to Professor. I'll be sure to email my head of school and let him know. <laughs> yeah, no I'll, I'll load you up. Oh, cheers. No, no, that's Sorry. fine. Go ahead. So I'm an associate lecturer in the law school here at Deakin. We're going to take a slightly different approach and talk about the student experience once students are already enrolled at Deakin University. There's comprehensive information on our website and probably in your packets about what students need in order to enrol in a degree. But that's why I've invited Mark Hale, who's a penultimate law student here, to actually give you the student perspective. And I'll give a quick introduction to the academic perspective. I'll start off by addressing the big elephant in the room. You've heard my colleagues talk about jobs, jobs, jobs. I'm sure you've all read the Finn Review. Um, there's a Lawyers Weekly newsletter that's talking about this oversupply of legal graduates. And I can see many of you smiling and giggling. I hear that all the time. It is probably the most common question I get at open days. Question one, do I have to be a lawyer? I'm not sure I want to be a lawyer. And two, can I actually get a job? Research is telling us that whilst the legal community is saying there is an oversupply of legal graduates, less than 50% of legal graduates actually have any interest in being practicing lawyers. So that's something I always talk to my students about, especially in first year is talking about the fact that you are not designated straight away, that you must be a lawyer, you must be a solicitor, you must be a barrister. That really terrifies a lot of students that come and study a Bachelor of Laws degree. I had a student come and talk to me at an open day saying that their goal is to be an interpreter for the United Nations and they thought a law degree would be a good stepping stone to achieving that goal. I've got a quote here from the Law Institute of Victoria President Jeff Bauer. And I think he's made a really excellent point in articulating the fact that the law degree is no longer solely a professional qualification. If you want to be a lawyer, it will absolutely get you there, no problem. But if you're interested in other types of work, especially around social justice, community engagement, government or the civil society sectors, a law degree will also open up doors into those types of pathways. I myself am a graduate of the Deakin Law School and before taking an academic appointment, I actually worked for a civil society organisation in New York in a non-legal role. But I know that my law degree was successful in getting me that interview and giving me the skills and capabilities to actually be able to undertake the work required. We heard this morning, especially from the panel, employer perspectives. What I thought was really interesting about this selection criteria was that from 2009 to 2013, and these are the most recent stats I could get, interpersonal communication skills written and oral were number one consistently every single year. Knowledge is further down. And that is something that a law degree really helps students achieve. Both written communication, a lot of our assessment is work and industry based, so writing a memo of advice to your supervising partner, doing a MOOC, so standing up in front of a retired judge, having to present your legal arguments and having critique and having questions asked about you. I'll link those graduate attributes discussions in with what employers are looking for. You heard the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Education Beverly Oliver and the Vice-Chancellor talk about Deakin's graduate attributes. So within the law school, we make sure that we assess the graduate attributes, but we also have our own threshold learning outcomes within the Bachelor of Laws. What I'd like to point out with both of these, discipline knowledge is only one. 
So absolutely understanding the law, being able to read and articulate and evaluate and analyse the law is absolutely a crucial skill that you would expect of any legal graduate. But that is not the only thing that a law degree teaches students. Communication. So one example of communication in our capstone, it's about legal problem solving and persuasion. Students conduct mediation, they conduct negotiations. They're up on their feet, they're having to give oral presentations for which they receive feedback on. In terms of, for example, teamwork, we run a Vienna MOOC competition every year. Students go and MOOC, so up on their feet in front of arbitrators in Hong Kong and Vienna in 2014, Deakin won that competition. One example of teamwork. Another example of teamwork, Deakin University participates in something called The Big Idea. I'm sure many of you are familiar with The Big Issue, the magazine that you'll often see being sold as you walk around the CBD. Deakin got together groups of students. They had to work in a team. They came from all different disciplines, including law. I mentored a team that made it all the way to the national finals. So within the law degree, there are many opportunities to acquire the soft skills that we consistently hear that employers are looking for. Self-management, teamwork, global citizenship. You can study Chinese commercial law in China. You can study Indian law in India. So the law degree is no longer you have to be in Victoria studying Victorian law. It's national and it's international. If I could now pass on to Mark, who'll provide some student experience perspectives and then we're happy to take any questions that you might have. Thanks, Trish. Okay, so I'm Mark. I'm a Bachelor of Commerce, Bachelor of Laws, double degree student in my second last year. Um, and I'm just going to talk about why Deakin really is the best place to study law from a student perspective. Um, so there's sort of two ways I'd break that down, both in classroom and out of the classroom experience. In the classroom, I think that there are two key things that really go to prove that this is the best place to study law. The first one is this amazingly supportive community of students. People here are genuinely friendly. The law students here are actually interested in networking. I can go into any lecture theater of 100, 200 law students and know that at Deakin, they are all going to be interested in talking to me. I can talk to them, strike up a conversation, get to know them. It's a friendly place. And I think because, let's face it, law is long and it takes long hours each week, if you have a supportive community around you, a com supportive community of students, it can actually become one of the best experiences of your life. And I do not doubt that I love law at Deakin because of the awesome network that I've been able to build up. And I was talking to a friend of mine just outside before, and she has finished her degree just, just recently over this T3, and she commented that the thing that's made Deakin amazing for her to study law here was, was the vibe of the student body. People are committed and driven here, and they are academic, but at the same time, they're open to meeting people. And I cannot emphasize that enough, that it is a really great place to study law because of that amazing society of students. So the first one is a really supportive body of students. The second reason that I would really promote law at Deakin is that here the teachers are not just teaching because it's half of the academic workload and they're academics primarily. Here, like Trish, they are here because they like to teach. They like to instill knowledge into young minds and so the reality is that they all have consultation hours that you can go to to explore the topic a bit more and in a bit more in-depth with them. They can take you through questions if you've written answers. The support that the academics give here is not confined to, you know, classroom time or, you know, particular hours a week that they're allowed to answer emails. They are always answering their emails. You can shoot out an email question to them and they get back to you really quickly. It is a great environment, and you really can develop some mentoring relationships with them. They love teaching. And when I participated in a, an accreditation process, Deakin applied to get accreditation from a European group, EPAS and Equus. And one of the big things that came out of that was the, the quality of the teachers, that they like teaching, that they're enthusiastic about it, and that they're very approachable, very engaged with the student body. They answer questions very quickly. So that's the second thing that I'd really like to really drive home as, you know, why I think that students should pick Deakin to study law at. The, the second half of why I think 
this was the best university to study law at and why I'm so happy with my choice is the out-of-classroom experience. And I think that there are three things which really go to showing that the out-of-classroom experience here is amazing. The first one is the Deakin Law Student Society runs about four or five different types of competition each year based around a whole range of skills. There are oral ones, advocacy ones, negotiation ones, and also ones around written skills. So even if you're a shyer law student, this is a great place to come because you can enter competitions that don't require you to get up and speak, that are based around your written ability, which is half of the lawyer skill set. The second thing that I'd emphasize um, in regards to why the out of classroom experience is so good here is the mentor program, which I manage. The mentor program here is a structured six week program. Um, you meet with your mentor for an hour, two hours, every week for the six weeks. And it's really, it eases that transition because one thing we see in students, and Trish teaches first year units and would see this as well, they come from high school where it's very structured, you're six, six half hour a day, and then you come to university and it's completely up to you, there's 10, 12 hours contact time. The mentor program really helps with that transition and the student engagement here is amazing because of it. And conscious of time, the, the third thing, I just really want to emphasize that, that Deakin is an amazing experience and that's why I, I really wanted to come to speak today. But the third thing is the work integrated learning opportunities at Deakin. Uh, within the Bachelor of Laws itself, there is the law clinic process, which is great. It lets students apply through the university. So it's also good for students that might not yet have legal experience to get their first experience because you're applying and lecturers and academics will assess the applications, not businesses. Now, the great thing about that is these clinics are so supportive, they're so engaged, they're picked for specific reasons and I did mine last year and it was an amazing experience. Um, and as Trish said, the Vismut, it's really a worldly competition. Deakin is one of the seven Ivy League universities at the Vismut competition, which if you speak to any commercial law firm, the Vismut, they know it, they love it. Um, so hopefully we win again. Only three universities have won twice. So I guess that that's, that's that. What I would say is Deakin is an amazing place to study law, supportive community environment, great mentoring programs, great teachers. Um, I'll be here at the lunch, so please come and talk to me if you have any questions. Thanks, Lawrence.